Good afternoon. Welcome to Educet Network. Friend, today we are going to discuss approaches to political thought. You know, there are several approaches to political thought, but we are focusing our lecture today on the modern Indian political thought, a creative theory perspective. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio uh, Dr. M. N. Thakur. Himself is a political scientist and commentator, and presently he teaches uh, political science at CPS Center for Political Study in Jawaharlal Nehru University, and regularly write on the um, political events on different uh, in different newspaper and magazines. So I think. His knowledge and experience will help us to understand this topic and give a kind of insight how to see the modern Indian political thoughts so on your behalf. I welcome him for the Educet lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amrindji. Uh, my aim today is to talk about uh, modern Indian political thought. Uh, as now, modern Indian political thought has become part of syllabus almost in all over the all over country. Uh, you have uh, different layers of that. You have at the undergraduate level some kind of courses. You have at the postgraduate level another kind of courses. So the idea is to think about how do we approach modern Indian political thought. So what I am going to do today is I am going to talk about how not to read Indian political thought and how to read Indian political thought, how to, how to understand them. So that is the engagement and I think that there is a perspective which I want to project, I want to talk about is a pers perspective called creative theory. So I will divide the lecture into three parts. My first part will be about the idea of the creative theory itself, the vantage point from where we will start looking at Indian political thought. Why do we, why do we need to engage with Indian political thought? This is the question I will raise in this section. In the second section, I will talk about how not to read Indian political thought. And in this, I will bring in some of the approaches which are known, well known for understanding Indian political thought and give a critique of them. And in the third section, I will propose another way of looking at that, which I call a creative theory perspective of reading Indian political thought. So let me begin with the first thing that is what is creative theory? It's a, it's a new name to a set of thinking. So a lot of scholars now are feeling that the, the theory building, theory building in our country particularly among the third world scholars has been an exercise which has never been taken very seriously. And most of the time what we do is we believe in the division of labor between East and the West and we take theories from somewhere and try to implement and understand our own reality through that theory. So the idea is that let us reclaim, let us reclaim our own capacity to build up theory and everybody is capable of theorizing as human beings are theory building beings, that is the first, first assumption that this creative theory begins with, that human beings are theory building beings. Everywhere and anywhere when human beings engage with problems, issues, conflicts, what they do to begin with is that they start theorizing that particular event. They start gener generating a very general understanding of that event, a generalized statements they create, they, they are in the habit of creating generalized statements on the basis of the experiences that they get. So human beings are theory building beings. Now many people who are influenced by western philosophy think that India never had political theory or the political theory is a, a kind of discipline or kind of uh, engagement that began in the West. Now the problem with this kind of thinking is that if you assume, if you accept that human beings are theory building beings, then you also will have to accept that in different time and space they must have been building theories. So if they do not have theory, would that mean that they are not human beings? 
So that is a crucial issue. I think that there could be different forms of expressing theory, but human beings are definitely theory building beings and they definitely produce theories in different circumstances. Therefore, in India also in different historical periods, human beings must have produced their theories. It is entirely possible that some of them produce their theories in, in, in the form of literature, some of them produce their theory in the form of social science language. As we know, social science language is not spontaneously accept, accessible to many people. Social science language is a very discipline based language produced in a definite space that is called university. So, within the university, if somebody is not trained, he, if he or she is outside the university, generally he or she does not have access to that language. And the community of the social scientists are so much, so much obsessed about this language that in, in which they talk to each other, they produce the knowledge that people who do not produce knowledge in that language, they think that is not social science. So, the first assumption if we agree with that human beings are theory building beings, then we have to also agree with this idea that all of us are theory building beings, whether we are in the university or outside the university, whether we are living in one place or the other place, where we are expressing our theories in the form of poetry or in the form of typical language of social science. So, language does not matter form does not matter, space does not matter, time does not matter. I think what matters is our capacity, our reflexive capacity to build up theories. What is reflexive capacity? This is the typical capacity, the peculiar capacity that human beings have where <coughs> through which they, they reflect on the, the reality, the, the engagement with the reality, any kind of reality and reality can also be of many kinds. See, the self is real, the society is real, the nature is real and our engagement with any of these things may produce certain kind of theoretical knowledge. So, we keep producing this kind of theoretical knowledge in different forms. The creative theory believes that it should engage with all such kind of forms of knowledge produced by human beings to understand what do human beings think and how do human beings manage their life on the earth. The second thing is that since we have agreed that every human being is a theory building being, every human being in, in a way is a philosopher as Gramsci calls it, then also the second thing is important that is we have to engage in dialogue. So, creative theory is uh, an invitation for dialogue that knowledge is not produced by one or two persons, knowledge is produced in a collective form, in a collective way and knowledge is produced only through dialogue. A theory is produced only through dialogue and when it is called dialogue, I think dialogue, the most important thing in the dialogue is that you believe in, in, in a kind of truth which is not absolute, which is, which is accessible by you, but not that you have access to the complete truth is entirely possible that the part of the truth you are understanding, part you are not. Somebody else may have also truth, a very Gandhian notion, but more than that it is an Anikantvadi notion, the Jainist philosophy which says that truth is relative, which basically means that all of us are trying to understand the reality, our approach, our understanding may depend on many factors and therefore it is entirely possible that we have only partial understanding of the, of the reality. And therefore, if we engage in a dialogue to each other, there will be kind of the reality will, will be lighted, the reality will come out. So, continuous dialogue with the assumption that anybody can be true is the methodological part of, of the creative theory. Uh, one can think of Habermasian form of dialogue that it assumes that any one of us can be true and therefore, 
it has enough space for, for understanding each other's viewpoint. Uh, the second thing is that there is a there is a idea that is in creative theory or creative theory would like to propose an idea that human beings produce knowledge in the process of struggle. So, all forms of struggle going around in order to understand the world in order to understand the reality, we have to engage with different forms of a struggle. A struggle and, and the movements are, are, are the methods through which we can understand the debates and issues. Therefore, human beings through their creative potentials try to understand the situation engage with that, engage in a struggle for liberation. Continuously human beings keep struggling with the circumstances to produce a new circumstance which can be more liberative. So, this kind of struggle can give us some idea of fresh theorization. Therefore, we need to engage in a dialogue with these movements. We need to engage in the dialogue with different cultures, different philosophies and dialogue as I said should be conceived as democratic negotiation in which nobody should be treated as superior or inferior. Everybody is treated as potentially creative being, creative living being and there is a need of intergenerational dialogue. So, there is a need of dialogue with the movements, there is a need dialogue with the struggles, there is a need of dialogue with generations, between generations, there is a need of dialogue with different cultures. So, all kind of dialogues should be promoted in for arriving on any idea of creativity, any idea of theorization or creative theorization. The third point is about the idea of liberation. At the core of the creative theory is the idea of liberation that all human beings and, and not only human beings, I do not want to be anthropocentric, I would, I would talk of any living being, but more of human being at the moment because I do not think other living beings are theory making build, theory building beings, but human beings are definitely theory building beings. So, all human beings believe in continuous struggle for, of, for liberation so that one can enjoy the creative potential of oneself. And therefore, you will find human history is a history of a struggle for liberation a struggle for breaking the boundaries of all kinds of boundaries. And it is constantly moving towards what we call universal human liberation, a project of universal li human liberation in which everybody is liberated, all human beings are liberated. So, we are constantly historically evolving through different kinds of struggles to achieve the, the the climax, the highest goal where all of us can be, can, can realize our own creative potentials. Now, how do we do that? There are four dimensions of liberation which are extremely important and you will, you can, you can see how these struggles are carried forward covering some of these dimensions and sometimes all of these dimensions. One of the dimensions is the human beings relation with the nature. How do we relate with the nature? Our survival, our physical survival depends on our, our capacity to access the nature, the natural you may say resources, but the, the nature as such is extremely important for our physical survival. We depend on nature for physical survival and therefore, all of us have natural right to 
resources, natural right to nature. And none of us has right to destroy the nature. None of us has right to appropriate more than we need. And also, it is our duty to, to, to see to it that resources are reproduced for the next generation. Anything that comes on the way, if some people capture the resources and suggest that this is our private property, I think that is not access acceptable. That is not, that can't be acceptable because the resources belong to all living beings per se, but human beings are much more creative and therefore this is their duty to not only to preserve the resources, even if they want to take away things from that, but also to reproduce it in a way that it should be available for the rest of the world, rest of the living beings too. Now, this would be very liberative if all of us have access to resources to the extent we need that. The second thing is my biological being, I am a biological being also and there is a need, biological need of the body. And one of the biological needs is to engage with the other human beings biologically. I think a society will be liberated society if this kind of engagement is feasible, if this kind of engagement is conditioned in a way that power relation does not come, come on the way, th that power relation does not stop us from doing this kind, engage in a relationship which is desired by us. So, body generating certain kind of desires are real desires and there should be legitimate way of fulfill those desires. And my biological being, the way I am surviving as a biological being, if that requires certain kind of engagement with either nature or other human beings, there should be some legitimate way of doing that. It should not be conditioned by the power relationship. So, we should not decide who will marry whom according to the according to the caste or community or class factors. But human being should be free to engage with other human beings merely on the basis of their attachment to each other. So all kind of social relations or power relations should be broken, should be, should be eliminated so that we can freely engage with others in terms of our reproductive rights also in terms of our, our psychological being and emotional being. I think this is a kind of liberative space where we become free human beings. Third is the domain of the knowledge. The knowledge is a collective project and human beings have produced a lot of knowledge about the nature, about the self, about society. The knowledge is about the human beings and their engagement with the reality. Therefore, it should be accessible to everybody. It should be freely accessible to everybody. There should not be any kind of intellectual property right. It should be so much freely accessible. The knowledge produced in any part of the world, any part of the world, by any generation, in any time and space, every human being has natural claim over this knowledge so that they can live in a better way. If that knowledge is necessary for, for a better life, definitely everybody has claim on it. So therefore, knowledge should not be controlled. There should be free flowing knowledge. The knowledge should be freely flowing to every, every society. And the last thing is, the fourth aspect is the consciousness. The consciousness is extremely important aspect of our being. The, the feeling of pain and pleasure is as real as the material resources. Therefore, the technology of the self, being conscious of the consciousness, the capacity to become conscious of the consciousness should be available to everybody. It is very important to understand that the technology of the consciousness, the con technology of the self should be, should be accessible to the people. We should have both time and space and knowledge of understanding our consciousness and engaging with the consciousness of the other human being. There should be free access to the collective consciousness and there is free access to 
the methods of transforming the collective consciousness and engaging with the collective consciousness. If we have these four elements, the, the natural resources, the biological being, the knowledge tradition, the science and all, and the consciousness, I think these are the four dimensions of liberation or of human freedom. And that is where creative theory suggests that this is the vantage point from where we should look at everything. Now, these are the points I make that about the creative theory. One, that there is an assumption in the creative theory that all human beings are creative, all human beings are theory building beings. There is a need to dialogue among themselves. There is a need to have a dialogue with culture, with the movements. There is a need to engage with different kinds of movements all over the world as these are liberation movements against certain structures of domination. Then there is a form of society which would call a liberated society, which is a vantage point from where we look at everything. That will be our, our desirable goal to achieve. So there is a value attached to this political theory. There is a, there is a, there is a constant uh, methodological rigor to understand things from this perspective. Having said that, if, if we assume it is, it is creative, it is creative in the sense that all of us are capable of theorizing, therefore we would theorize ourselves, we will engage in dialogue with other theories and our theorization is based on our democratic negotiation and our theorization is aimed at creating a liberation society. If we assume with this as creative theory, agree with this as creative theory, then the question will begin how to engage with modern Indian political thought. That is the second part of my, my lecture. How do we engage with modern and political thought? But before I begin with this idea how to engage with modern political thought, I should talk of how not to engage with modern political thought. And what is modern political thought? We, as we know that modern political thought was produced by activists, the, the, the freedom fighters, the, the great thinkers of India who were engaged in a big liberation struggle against colonialism. And it was not only a struggle against colonialism, but it was a struggle against many other forms of domination. And therefore, we need to engage with that carefully. When I'm saying well, how not to engage with, with, with this, how not to engage with, with, with in political thought, I think before saying that, let me make another point that why do we need to engage with that? As I said, this is a discourse, modern Indian political thought is a discourse produced during human beings struggle against different forms of domination. Therefore, this set of ideas is extremely important, extremely important part of our collective consciousness. It is extremely important part of our resource and we must try to access that resource to frame anything in future. And sim similar struggles everywhere. I think it's not only Indian political thought. One should access all kinds of ideas produced by different forms of struggles all over the world. Now, how not to study is, I think one of the, one of the methods of studying is to see this set of ideas as in terms of modernity and tradition. That well, modernity emerged in the West. We were a traditional society. This modern people, the modern ideas came from the West to us and our leaders also got educated in the West. Then they came back here. They wanted to modernize our society. Therefore, they did it through various means. Some of them copied the modern ideas to India. They wanted us to follow that those modern ideas. Some of them agreed that, well, we have our own traditional way of living. We should not engage with modernity. And third was that critical modernity or critical traditionalism that, well, that is also good. We can do some modifications uh, here and there. We can do modify. We need to modify modernity. We need to modify tradition. And that is how we can put them together. Bhikkhu Parikh writes about Gandhi that Gandhi's project was to modernize the tradition. I think this is, a, this is not a great idea to think of this 
set of ideas as part of the modernity project. You know why? Because I think the moment you think of this being part of the modernity project, then even if you talk of multiple modernities as a lot of people have started talking about this these days, you are going to prioritize modernity and modernity is something that is produced by certain circumstances. I have no problem with that. If you engage in a dialogue with them, if you think we are copying that here, if you think all these scholars will be copying these things here, a lot of people write that, well, you forget the name, Ernest Gellner say, that you forget the name, you take the ideas, all those ideas will look similar. So what basically they want to say is that all those modern ideas were being copied in India in different ways. The language was a little different or, or little different engagements were there, but mainly it was expansion of the modern ideas. And therefore, Indian political thought should be seen as if the modern ideas are being expanded in Indian discourse and Indian languages. I think there is a big problem. One problem, of course, as I said, that you are permanently in a subordinate position. Then the, the idea was generated somewhere and you are trying to copy that idea here. You are not engaging a dialogue with them. You are copying the idea here. I think this kind of East and West is not, uh, the idea of the East and West thinking does not give you much benefit. The other way is that you say that East is East, West is West. Therefore, we do not need to engage with them. The Western ideas are Western ideas produced in the Western societies. I think even that is not the best way to read Indian political thought. I think we must see how in the process of liberation struggle, these thinkers were accessing ideas from all over the world and engaging with them, them in a dialogue. The dialogue is important and the prioritization is not important. When you are struggling, when you are raising a war, when you are fighting the structure of domination, you do not believe in, you would not believe in thinking whether you would not reject an idea on the ground that it has come from somewhere. If the idea is useful for you, you will take that. I think the creative thinking, the way Gandhi, Ambedkar, Tagore, Nehru, everybody engaged with the West was not kind of copying from the from that modern the modern ideas of the west but engaging with them the other other approaches treating this as east and west tradition the eastern thought and the western thought and then the question some people have raised is it a derivative discourse is indian political thought a derivative discourse very much similar to the first approach. Sometimes you say it is the modern idea being propagated here and since modern is a more universal idea, therefore you do not talk of east and west, but you talk of modern and tradition and say that you are traditional, they are modern, so you are copying their ideas here. In the east-west framework, you say that well, it, these ideas were western and you are eastern, Eastern think in different way, western think in different way. What happened in this process was that the western ideas became dominant in the East. I think Parsa Chatterjee talks of this question and in the beginning he does talk of this question as East versus West, how people think that Western ideas are being, being copied here. As I quoted Gilder, Gilder would agree with this idea that well all these ideas are same, basically the modern Western ideas being copied here, in, in this case it becomes Western. And he would ask, why do, we, why do we continue with that? Why do not we generate our own ideas? I think this is not a great question to ask. We do not need to ask this question that from where are we taking this idea? Whether it was generated in West or East, that is not problem, that is not an issue. Issue is that are we engaging with these ideas, ideas in a creative way or not? And I think none of these thinkers were copying the western or the modern ideas to India, but most of them were having their own circumstances, their own struggle and whatever was useful for that struggle they were trying to carry forward. There was a reality check all the time. There was a constant praxis that you are engaging with the struggle and you are trying to theorize. Constantly you are working on two planes. You are also changing most of the time. 
So the idea that we should treat this as Eastern idea or derivative discourse, whether it is a derivative discourse or indigenous discourse, I think this is not an issue. Issue is that we have to see how during the struggle, during the struggle for liberation, emancipation and I use the word emancipation and liberation interchangeably, how during that struggle these people engaged with certain set of ideas already available produced by some human beings in their own struggles. And there is no question of being dominated by that as during the struggle if you have to raise a movement you cannot copy any idea. The movements can only be raised if you are engaging with the people and if you are engaging with the people who have no exposure of that idea then you have to reply to the questions that they are raising. And in that process, in that dialogue with the, with, the, with the masses, you transform, you generate new ideas. So therefore, this idea of East versus West does not seem to be a great idea. There is another perspective which suggests that, well, the elites in India were carrying the Western ideas here or the modern ideas here, but there were subaltern classes. Subaltern classes, for them, the option of indigenous versus western was not there as the indigenous land knowledge was available only in Sanskrit language and was not accessible to them. Therefore, when you are talking to these subaltern philosophers like Ambedkar or Foley, you do not need to talk about it because they were, they were accessing the west definitely for bringing liberation ideas. And just because they were accessing the West, they cannot call it derivative philosophers. I think there is a point in this that they were accessing different ideas for liberation, but we have to remember this also that this accessing the other idea was possible and feasible not because they were, did not have access to the indigenous ideas, but because they were looking for ideas everywhere. So, Ambedkar has accessed Indian ideas, Ambedkar has engaged with Buddhism and has engaged with Marxism also, has engaged with Western philosophy of freedom also. So I think all of them, let me, let me conclude this point, that all of them, all the thinkers in India, they were open to the ideas as their aim was raising movements of liberation of different kinds. So they were engaging with any possible available idea which was attracting them. It was not a question of being a modern idea or being a traditional idea or modernizing the tradition or of the western idea, the eastern idea. These issues were not there with them. These issues can be with us now in the post-independence period where we are, we are creating these binaries for our, our own existence. These identity bin binaries were not important for the people of that time. Okay, so I would like to say that do not read this Indian, modern Indian thought as part of modernity tradition project or tradition, modernizing the tradition project or the East West, the derivative discourse or, or indigenous discourse debate. There is no point in reading this thought, thought in the light of these two kinds of framework. Now, what is the alternative framework that I want to suggest? I want to suggest that the ideas produced during that time were very creative ideas and the, the points I made in the beginning about the creative theory. I think most of them, all of them were creative theorists because they were engaging a dialogue, they were prioritizing liberation. They were believing in the strength of every human being from all caste, creed and gender and anything. So it was a creative society at the time. The creative space was open for everybody. Everybody was, was possibly contributing in some way or other in the thinking that was going on at the time. But how do we decipher this kind of thing? I think the first thing we have to understand is and that is very important that as a student of this, this set of ideas, we have to own the project of the philosophers of that time. 
what is I mean by saying owning the project? By owning the project would mean that look at the purpose for which they were theorizing. Look at the project that they had and what was the project they had? The project was universal human liberation. The project was that of the liberation of the human beings as such. If that is our project, if we want to engage with that, if we want to carry forward this project, then probably we can understand these things better. And I would like to quote Marx that well, think as I am thinking. So if you think as Gandhi was thinking, if I think as Ambedkar was thinking, then probably the text will start making sense to us. Otherwise, it will not make sense to us. Unfortunately, most of the third world scholarship at the moment is based in the university system, not in the struggle. They do not own the Gandhian project. They only read Gandhi's text or Ambedkar's text and they try to understand what they were saying. I think we have to, we have to acknowledge this fact that these ideas were not static but dynamic. Where they were struggling constantly and theorizing also. It was a practice moment, the struggle and theorize and test the theory, test the theory on the ground and change it again. So constant evolution of theory was taking place. It was a dynamic thought. Gandhi makes it very clear when he says that if you find something contradictory, what I am saying, you must believe in the latter thing. Why was he saying that? Because it, he was constantly evolving. I am not saying that you, you minimize, you, you do not take the other things seriously. What I am saying is that for him actually, the idea that he was producing, he was standing for something at one moment, but maybe he was changing his idea because he was exposing himself to reality. Reality itself was in fast flux and therefore it was dynamic. And a dynamic situation, text, text that they produce at, in one historical time has a lot of limitations. The texts are dead, documentation of certain ideas at one time by the time text is finished, ideas have already moved. So every time they do not have time to revise the text. So text can be important document through which we enter into the consciousness, but not the only document. I think we have to understand, we have to capture the dynamism beyond the text also. So we have to see how the ideas were evolving from one to the other. Look at Ambedkar, what he says in the beginning, what he says at the end, lot of difference. Towards the end he thought that, in the beginning he thought that state was very liberative. Towards the end he thought that state is not liberative enough. So this is what I think was extremely important. Third thing is the collective consciousness of the time. I think they were engaging with the collective consciousness of the time. So when they were reflecting on the on the issues that they, they were handling, I think was not in terms of preserving the tradition, but they were trying to see how people were thinking. When you want to mobilize people, what do you do? You have to engage with the ideas that people were having in mind. Therefore, they picked up many symbols, they picked up many texts, they picked up many ideas through which they tried to enter into the collective consciousness of the people. They try to engage with the people. So mobilization required this kind of engagement. And, and, and what is philosophy? It is not very, I, I would agree with Gramsci who says that everybody is a philosopher and the collective consciousness is the source of philosophy. So what they were doing was they were engaging with people as philosophers. Some people commit a mistake of taking Gandhi as a postmodern thinker like Rudolf and Rudolf. Well, they do not understand that in fact he was engaging with the collective consciousness through what is called Anikantvad. So Anikantvad talks of relativity of the truth, but that is an invitation for the dialogue. Some people think he was a postmodern because he was not having the idea of one universal truth. Look at Tagore. 
he, he delivered a lecture in, in England saying that the source of my philosophy is the Baal tradition or Ambedkar says that the source of my philosophy is Buddhism. So you have, you have set of thinkers trying to mobilize people against the structure of domination called colonialism and casteism and whatever. The options they had were limited. The options they had as the options were limited to those, op those things which were, which were present in the collective consciousness. Therefore, you will find that Gandhi was engaging with Gita and everybody engaged with Gita. Nobody who, who was a great leader at that time could refrain from engaging with Gita, either this way or that way. They talked about it because that was the part of the collective consciousness. So therefore, if you want to understand Indian political thought properly, the modern Indian political thought properly, you have to see this dynamic thought and their engagement with the collective consciousness. We need not to take that as a communal. We need not to take that as limiting factor. We need to see this as how in a, in a, in a movement, in a mobilization process, in a movement for liberation, you actually engage with the collective consciousness, the elements of the collective consciousness, and how you turn them in your favor. Something that was producing a very static society, you turn that into a favor of the movement. That is something we must learn from them. We must see this as, as it is. The fourth thing is the dialogue among the thinkers. You see, these thinkers, we were talking to each other at the time. They were engaging in debate as that was a moment of politics. But within that moment, within that engagement of debate, you will find that they were also creating a perspective. Now, today, the debate is important between them. But that debate should not be dysfunctional. The debate should be functional in understanding the available perspectives on something so that we can arrive on the new, new theory. Constantly engaging with them, treat them as engaging in a dialogue on something. Not that they were sure about things, they were engaging in dialogue, learning from each other. And if we use that method today of engaging, put them into engagement, probably our generation will learn a lot of things from there. In, our, in, in theory building. We can create new theories by examining the different terms of debate that was happening at the time. It was a dialogue, treat that as a dialogue between, between these thinkers and we bring out theories from there for ourselves. And the last thing is that we need to do new experiments. We need to use their ideas to do new experiments and then we can see what is the meaning of what they were debating. Unfortunately, today, the university system, when it tries to understand their ideas, do not engage in, in, in experiment. We treat, therefore, text as the final thing. And therefore, we limit them. We, we conclude that they were fighting among each other. One is opposed to Gandhi, was opposed to Ambedkar. Gandhi was opposed to Tagore or something like that. Tagore was opposed to Gandhi. I think that's not true. I think we have to really see how, how far we can use these ideas in the experiment, which is always growing. And we can then generate new ideas. We can then generate new theories. So creative theory would suggest that we engage in dialogue with them, capture the nature of their theorization, how they were theorizing, and own the project of universal liberation. Then probably we can draw maximum resources from these thinkers. Thank you very much. So, uh, you are talking about emphasizing on dialogue. So, dialogue um, uh, in terms of what, what could be the elements of dialogue? One is just to outline the text is not the only thing, rather we should include, uh, we should uh, widen the scope or range of the um, uh, theory given by the different uh, like Gandhi, Ambedkar. So, how a uh, new uh, thinker will enhance their, uh, increase their See, scope. what we can do is, suppose Gandhi and Ambedkar both are talking on religion. Mm. So look at their, their, their engagement, look at the points they are making. And instead of putting Gandhi against Ambedkar, Ambedkar against Gandhi, if we try to see what is the terms of debate, and then we use our own creative method of engaging with those debates, 
and coming to conclusion. I think that's how we can use that as a reservoir of knowledge for our own theorization. What they have discovered at their own time of struggle, we can learn from that. Not that we can copy that for our own struggle. I think okay. the struggle today will have to be in its own way. Mm -hmm. It has to have its own method of deciding things. That we can only use at great reservoir of knowledge available to our humanity for the future generation. Okay, uh, and you suggesting not rush to the conclusion, what generally we Exactly, find. not rush to the conclusion. Okay. Not keep things open for some time, debate with them. There okay. are multiple possibilities And there. test it with the um, practical problem what we face, exactly. kind of contemporary times. Exactly, contemporary times, let's test those problems. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's try to engage with the problems and see whose idea can be much more useful in that, whether okay. Gandhi's or Ambedkar's, anybody. Uh, uh, given the um, advancements in technology and the way people are thinking nowadays, yeah, the globalization or the um, thing has hap happened in the last 50 years, the thinkers um, uh, of um, uh, 18th century yeah, before that, uh, how do uh, how that will uh, yardstick or we can the way we look at those um, uh, political scientists and. Uh, uh, be explained the present things happening in a uh, contemporary time. I think that's very important. That's very important. Uh, the way the uh, the thinkers uh, of today in the era, era of globalization, they are facing the issues. They are much more complex issues, mm -hmm. much more complex than what Gandhi and Ambedkar faced actually at that time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, probably we need to have more more sophisticated method of engaging with those thinkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and society has also changed. The society has changed. Yes, agricultural that's right. society, that's then right. industrialist that's society, right. and then that's now right. we have network society. We have a very different kind of society. society. Therefore, we should not really reduce these thinkers into symbols. Okay. We should not reduce them into symbols, static symbols. Like mm -hmm. Gandhi is reduced to static symbols. Second October, we celebrate his birthday, then he's over. Mm -hmm. Ambedkar is reduced as a static symbol by the community or by the state. Now by the state. Earlier by the community, now by the state. If you reduce them into static symbols, then that becomes a big problem. So but then we don't access their mm -hmm. ideas. We don't see them as dynamic thinkers, but we see them as static representatives of some idea. So we don't need symbolism. Now we need synthesis of different ideas. Exactly. We don't need symbolism. We need synthesis. We need debate. We need to engage with them democratically okay. and take them very seriously. So what the caution you would like to suggest while people framing such kind of framework to explain the contemporary problem with the eye of the, um, uh, these the, uh, olden thinkers? The caution is that you really have to have the agenda very clear in your mind. If your agenda is very narrow, then probably you will not get much out of it. If your agenda is wide enough, if your agenda is to resolve the issues that humanity is facing at the time and your agenda is, is universal human liberation, then probably you will find them more interesting. So the caution is that please don't read them with narrow purposes. Okay. Read them with, with wide purposes, with the larger project of what you call universal human liberation. The last question I'd like to ask you, so far what we have seen that the thinker or uh, uh, think, uh, thinkers are in the boundary of uh, ism, baad, Hindi mein baad karte hain. Now those boundaries are uh, breaking, yeah, new, uh, we can say no, no new ism is coming up. So is this time to see the things in a ism, uh, in Vaad, or, yeah, we need to come uh, out of you it? You know, Gandhi was one of the, those who said that, don't reduce my ideas into Vaad, ah. in ism. Okay. I think he was right. There's a problem with the Vaad, Vaad always closes the boundary. I think the thinkers need to engage in dialogue with each other. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you don't have an ideology. That only means that ideology should not be closed. Okay. Ideology should not become false consciousness. Ideology is then in that case is a knowledge that you have till now and you are working out things on the basis of that knowledge explicitly expressed that this is what I'm going to do. But that doesn't stop you from engaging in a dialogue with the other people. And that is extremely important that ideology should not be, should not introduce a closer. It should introduce, it should enable us in debating with others. If I'm transparent that this is what I think, at the moment this is how I'm thinking, then you can easily engage with me and tell me that what you're thinking is not right. 
I should be open on that to engage with you. I should be open in that, in dialoguing with you that, well, why am I not right? The tragedy today, what is happening is that once I have an ideology, I close that down. I don't want to change that. For years and years, decades and decades, you look at the political parties, they have fixed ideologies. How can you have fixed ideas when things are changing so fast? I think there is a need to have openness in that. So the notion of ideology probably itself needs to be transformed. Okay. It still needs to be, to be porous in terms of so getting ideas from the kind of places. testing time of ideology. Absolutely. This is the testing time for traditional ideologies. Okay. Maybe it will produce new kinds of ideologies now. Okay. Maybe it will have more porous ideologies now, which will be which will be making debates possible. Because ideologies have stopped the debating people. Now you are following an ideology, you don't need to debate with others. Because you already have a condition. Yes. You are predictable. I think that is the problem. To say that I believe in this, to say that I agree with this is not a problem. Okay. To say that I will never change is a problem. If I mean that's what the that's what is an issue to be learned from these people. See, Gandhi, Ambedkar, anybody, constantly evolving, constantly transforming. That constant evolution and transformation is possible if you're engaging in a movement. I think this, if you're only engaging in electoral politics, mm -hmm. then you will start creating identities. What we see in the ideology have the world appeal, but in coming days, what we find that that will have uh, ideology of time, not of the um, classical sort of things. No, yes, this is modern period was period of ideologies, mm -hmm. and I think that period is over now. Uh, if you mean by classical this modern period, I think the modern period is over. We are more, I mean, we have to, we have to open up the ideology as such. We have to, we have to, in that sense, mm -hmm. we ha or let me put it like this, instead mm -hmm. of ideology being, being false consciousness, we have to reclaim ideology as knowledge. Okay. The knowledge based set of ideas on which I agree. The moment you convert this into a knowledge, it means that if there is a change in the technology of knowing, if you, there is a change in the knowledge, you are ready to change accordingly. You don't fix up yourself. Because religion is an ideology that way. Okay. And what is the difference between religion and science is that religion fixes things forever to come. Science keeps it open. If religion opens it up, then it is as, as good as science. Because then there is a possibility of modification within that. Okay. Then you say that, well, this is something that was they practiced, being practiced, hmm. now it need not be practiced because things have changed. Okay. So I think we have to move from the age of ideology to age of knowledge. Okay. That would be my question. So, well friends, with this note, we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on behalf, I thank Dr. M. N. Thakur for giving such a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>